Come in, come in, Humphrey. Prime Minister, I want to talk to you about Prime Minister's question. Thank you. Ago. I accept your congratulations. Uh, well, I wasn't, wasn't I brilliant? Uh, well, I didn't. Didn't uh, you think so? Well, I wasn't there, but. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> wasn't I brilliant, Bernard? Uh, uh, well, I believe your replies this afternoon will not be quickly forgotten. Uh, let me tell you what happened, Humphrey. <laughs> the first question was about that Home Office cock up over the shortage of prison officers. My reply was masterly. I said, I refer the Honourable Member to the speech I made in this House on October the 28th. Did he remember what you'd said? Well, no, of course not. Neither did I come to that. <laughs> Still, shut him up. The next one was about unemployment and whether the Department of Employment fiddled the figures. You mean periodically restructure the base from which the statistics have been derived without drawing public attention to the fact? Exactly, fiddle the figures. <laughs> well, of course they do. I know they do. But I said, I'd found no significant evidence of it. That's because you haven't been looking. And because we haven't shown you. I know. Well done, Humphrey. Then we went straight on to a googly about the Department of Energy's plans for disposing of nuclear waste. The question was trying to get me to admit that the Cabinet was divided. Well, it is. Well, I know that. So I said, my Cabinet took a unanimous decision. That's only because you threatened to dismiss anyone who wouldn't agree. <laughs> you certainly made them agree unanimously. <laughs> By this time, my backbenchers were cheering my every word. Oh, yeah. then we had a question about why, since we'd spent so much money on it, our new anti-missile missile was scrapped as obsolete the day before the first one came off the production line. <laughs> and how did you wriggle out of that one? Wriggled out? That was my masterstroke. My reply, Humphrey, was sheer genius. I simply said our policy had not been as effective as we hoped. Clearly, we had got it wrong. <laughs> you admitted that? Yeah, brilliant, wasn't it? <laughs> Took the wind right out of his sails. <laughs> Honesty always gives you the advantage of surprise in the House of Commons. <laughs> there was actually a supplementary. The Prime Minister was asked when he would request the resignation from the responsible minister. Too easy. I said I'll ask for his resignation when he makes a mistake that could have been seen at the time and not with the benefit of hindsight. <laughs> they were on their feet, cheering, stamping, waving their order papers. I gather that there was a question about the bugging of an MP's telephone. Oh, yes, I got a terrific laugh with that. I said... I know, Bernard, <laughs> No, I said, much as I respect... Yes, John... I know, Bernard, tell me. Oh. oh, well, anyway, that was just stupid. I mean, why should we bug Hugh Halifax's telephone? I mean, one of my own administration. Don't know where they got such a daft idea. Sheer paranoia. Yes, the only thing is... I mean, that... why should we be listening to MPs? Boring, stupid, ignorant windbags? <laughs> I do my best not to listen to them. But he's only a PPS. I have enough trouble finding out what's going on at the Ministry of Defence. What could he know? So, I gather you denied that Mr Halifax's phone had been bugged. Well, obviously. It was the one question today to which I could give a clear, simple, straightforward, honest answer. Yes. Unfortunately, although the answer was indeed clear, simple and straightforward, there is some difficulty in justifiably assigning to it the fourth of the epithets you applied to the statement. <laughs> in as much as the precise correlation between the information you communicated and the facts insofar as they can be determined and demonstrated is such as to cause epistemological problems <laughs> of sufficient magnitude as to lay upon the logical and semantic resources of the English language a heavier burden than they can reasonably be expected to bear. <laughs> Epistemological? What are you talking about? You told a lie. A lie? A lie. What do you mean, a lie? I mean, you... lied. <laughs> uh, yes, I know this is a difficult concept to get across to a politician. Um, <laughs> you, uh, and, um, ah, yes, you did not tell the truth. You mean, we are bugging you, Halifax's telephone? We were. We were. When did we stop? Um, 17 minutes ago. <laughs> Quite even separating out the component causes, let alone allocating responsibility for them, is a task of such analytical delicacy as not to be susceptible of compression within the narrow <laughs> confines of a popular radio program. Humphrey <laughs> Appleby, thank you very much. <laughs> if that was a popular program, what would an unpopular program be like? <laughs> thank you very much, Sir Humphrey. Oh. Absolutely splendid. My pleasure, thank you. Was I all right? Well, couldn't you have said a bit more, especially about unemployment? Is that yeah? Well, uh, the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you laugh? Oh, my dear Ludo, nobody tells the <laughs> truth about unemployment. Oh, why not? Well, because everybody knows you could halve it in a few weeks. But how? 
cut off all social security to any claimant who refuses two job offers. There's genuine unemployment in the north, but the south of England is awash with layabouts, many of them graduates, <laughs> living off the dole and housing benefit, plus quite a lot of cash they pick up without telling anybody. You mean uh, moonlighting? Well, sunlighting, really. Most employers will tell you they're short-staffed, but offer the unemployed a street-sweeping job, or a dishwashing job, they'd be off the register before you could say parasite. <laughs> Frankly, this country can have as much unemployment as it's prepared to pay for in Social Security, and no politicians have got the guts to do anything about it. Oh, I do wish you'd said that. I'm sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come along, Bernard, come on. Sorry. What's this for? The BBC have just sent me this tape, apparently it's part of my interview. They say it's particularly interesting. <laughs> uh, your interview? You sound surprised that I should have said something interesting, Bernard. Oh, uh, no, no, uh, Sir Humphrey. It's just that I thought you uh, intended to say nothing, as always. I mean... Uh... Switch it on, Bernard. You may learn something. <laughs> <laughs> My dear Ludo, nobody tells the truth about unemployment. Oh? Why not? Because everyone knows you could have it in a few <laughs> All social security to all claimants who refuse two job offers. <laughs> and no politicians have got the guts to do anything about it. Sir Humphrey, that wasn't you, was it? <laughs> yes, Bernard. But how could you say such things? Is there any more? <laughs> Yes, Bernard. <laughs> as damaging of, as what we've just heard? More damaging. <laughs> I believe I referred to parasites. How could you be so indiscreet? The interview was over. We were just chatting harmlessly. Harmless. It was off the record. It was on the tape. <laughs> oh, my God, I've just realised. Blackmail. Blackmail? Read that. Here is a copy of your off-the-record part of the radio interview. We found it very interesting. We will contact you shortly. What do they want of me, Bernard? The BBC? Licence fee up 50%? <laughs> maybe it's a private blackmail by the producer. Well, maybe. Doesn't he know I'm a poor man? <laughs> maybe he hasn't read you live in abject poverty on 81,000 a year. <laughs> Bernard, what am I going to do? Well, keep your mouth shut in future. And so must you, Bernard. I don't want you to breathe a word about this to anyone. Anyone, do you hear? My duty to the... Bernard, I won't... <laughs> oh, Bernard, what am I going to do? Well, perhaps you should put out a press statement expressing sympathy for the unemployed. <laughs> well, you may be joining them any moment. 